Okay, everyone, welcome back to our to our third session, I think it is, of the morning of our fourth Diverse Ed event. Um, we've got a brilliant lineup for you for this session about school culture. We've talked about the landscape. We've talked about the curriculum. It's now about how we can create cultures in our schools to embrace and celebrate diversity. And I'm joined by four speakers. We have Naomi Ward, a former school leader who is the founder of Purposeful Educators. We have Audrey Pantelis, who is a former head teacher um, who is doing work around diversity and smashing glass ceilings and concrete ceilings. Um, we have Patrick Otley O'Connor, who is an executive head teacher who's going to talk about inclusive allyship. And we have Hannah Jepson, who is a specialist in all things diversity and a business psychologist, who's going to talk to you about the unconscious bias in the recruitment process. So first up is Naomi. Naomi, over to you. Thank you, Hannah. And hello, everyone, friends, colleagues, um, and new friends. It's wonderful to be here. So we're here to talk about culture. And culture, for me, in its essence, is how we are with each other. And a culture is created by the quality of our interactions. So I work with a community called Purposeful Educators. And we have a belief that we take a stand for. And that belief is that we are all artists, poets, and geniuses. And the quality of our culture flows from that. The quality of our interactions flows from that. And I'm going to invite you to try that on for a moment. So just bring that belief into your awareness. Everyone on this call, everyone here now, everyone watching this in the future is an artist, a poet, and a genius. They have everything they need to create the life they want to create, everything they need to create the impact that they want to have that might be a spark inside them or it might be burning inside them. They have everything they need to bring that into reality. And I invite you to send that out to everyone here. And now to turn that energy back onto yourself, that you as well are that artist, that poet, that genius. It's powerful, it's generative, if we believe that about each other within a culture. Um, and how many of us have worked in cultures where that is a belief? <laughs> um, so from this foundation, I want to talk about purpose. So purpose for me is two things. In one hand, it's your unique fingerprint of your gifts, your skills, your story, your strength, your values. And in the, imp in the other hand, it's the impact that you are called to have, that you are born to have, that you know deep down is there. And so when you have that sense of purpose, you will take a stand for it <laughs> because you will feel it and you will um, speak up and you will find your people because you can't do anything alone. And if you can't find your people um, who are coming together around this purpose, then start a community. I mean, this is incredible about Diverse Ed and all the other communities that have come together. So how do you create your purpose? Well, Ben Okri has this wonderful quote, which is, stories are a reservoir of values. And I would say that's true for purpose as well. So your purpose is within you, within your stories. And I'll give you a quick example of that through um, an educator I work with called Danny. So she was coming back from um, parental leave and she spoke about this kind of tangled cloud of anxiety that would follow her as she pushed her son around the park. Um, and she, we talked about that, but we also talked about her stories. And she told me about her tutor group. Um, a year nine tutor group who made up for what they lacked in numbers with personality. You know, you know, you know the group I mean. And one day a boy came up to her, a boy with uh, learning difficulties, and he said, Miss, Miss, I really want to sing to the class today. Is that OK? He'd missed the talent show. And she said, um, took a deep breath and said, yeah, of course you can. And so he went out to prepare to sing. And um, she turned to her class and they said, no, it's OK, Miss. We know what you're going to say. We've got him. We'll take care of him. And he came in and he sang and they celebrated him and they clapped 
and applauded him. And this was just what she did, and she didn't understand yet that this was kind of her zone of genius, that she was able to create a space where everyone belonged. And so from that and other stories, we created her purpose, which was, I am the champion who emboldens people to be mindful of themselves and others. And from that place, it's a, it's a movement into action. And she went into action. She um, created mindfulness assemblies, mindfulness spaces before um, exams. And only in awareness of our purpose and bringing it up to the light are, there, are we then able to take skillful action that really expresses our true self. And my dream for school cultures is that all of us are able to take a stand for our unique value and purpose and express it in order to have that impact that we were born to have. So my pledge, I guess, is to continue to take a stand for the people I work with and their unique value and purpose and, and for you to do that and for you to call that forth in the others that you work with. And let's create those cultures where we can bring that diversity of purpose to the fore. Beautifully put, Naomi. You framed the session so well, and there's lots of really positive um, traction in the comments. Um, and I think what we need to do as educators is think about the conditions for inclusion and belonging that we create in our classrooms how can we create those conditions in our workplaces for our adult colleagues as well? Um, I was quite shocked to hear from lots of women of colour this week who are head teachers where not a single adult in their staff body or governing body has asked whether they are OK. Hasn't asked to check, check in with them. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Audrey then, who's going to talk about some of the systemic, societal and structural barriers that we need to collectively smash in order for people to progress. Thank you, Hannah. Morning, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the systems and some of the things that I've seen um, from my own perspective um, as a black woman, but then also just talk a little bit more about kind of possibly some kind of uh, call to arms and some actual actions. Um, so I will end with some kind of um, points that maybe um, might generate uh, some questions for you to have a think about. So. My name's Audrey, Audrey Panteris, uh, and I've been in education now for nearly 30 years. If I say it quickly, then uh, hopefully it doesn't seem too long. Uh, and I've been an unqualified teacher. I've been a teacher. I've been a head of department. I've been a head of faculty. I've been an assistant head teacher. And all of this was in the main street. Uh, and then I changed phase and went into special educational needs and then I kind of went back and started again. So I was a class teacher and I was a head of department and I was a head of education before then um, becoming a head of school. And um, I've recently left my permanent head of school role and I'm currently undertaking um, interim roles at the moment and also looking at different areas, including uh, this particular area of diversity and smashing ceilings. So throughout my career, all the time, most of the time, I've suffered setbacks like most people have. Um, and as I've got further up the ladder, as it were, um, what I have found is that, of course, um, the, the opportunities um, to kind of progress have slowly become more diminished, um, despite there being a lack of head teachers in the country, which is interesting, isn't it? Um, and I very rarely in my interview situation, when I would get to an interview, lucky enough to get to an interview, rarely see other black candidates, very, very rarely. And despite the amount of initiatives that we have um, that have been put into place over, over time, um, we, we don't have that diversity in senior teams in schools and we don't even have them in boardrooms across the country and indeed the world. So you've heard of the glass ceiling concept and you'll know that, you know, that that's defined as an, an, an and I'm going to read the definition here, an unacknowledged barrier to advancement in a profession, especially affecting women and members of minorities. Now, I'm going to go so far as to say that actually as a black woman, actually, we have concrete ceilings. Um, so glass, you can see through, but concrete, there's nothing to see. Literally, that's it. You, you can't permeate that. And so as a result of that, what we, we are starting to see, starting to get an idea of that cultural diversity. And we, um, if you like, we're, I won't say we're tinkering at it because in certain aspects and in certain particular um, organisations and in schools as well, um, we're, we do get that appreciation of the differences in, in individuals. And we, we see that in, in, in the variety of ways. And we've heard that this morning as well. Um, 
But what is not so well promoted these days is the opportunity to rise um, and to steer the culture itself. And it kind of echoes what Naomi was saying, but we all have something to bring to the table. And, and that isn't necessarily uh, the case. And we know that there are a growth of minority workplaces that um, and workforces, which creates dynamic, multicultural and uh, uh, kind of vibrant kind of workplaces. And we're really big at that, aren't we, in schools for the kids, but we're not so big on that for the staff. And you may argue, OK, well, actually, it's a school it's for children and that's right. But actually, um, surely we should be celebrating everybody in there and, and not just making it a kind of a pupil and, 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 and adult kind of um, separation. And what we'll get if we don't kind of challenge our stereotypes and if we don't challenge our prejudices, um, we're going to get a culture that just means that we just get the same, which is kind of what we're talking about already. The fact that, you know, our, our you know, recruitment panels are male, pale and stale. Um, and, and that's a shame because, of course, we are all bringing such vibrancy, every single one of us, regardless of our colour, um, um, of, of, of what we can do. We're bringing in vibrancy. So some schools and some organisations think about diversity training and they think, yeah, that's great, you know, um, but how well do we actually understand it? Patently, we're not understanding it very well. Um, I, I would go to say that we've got a situation where um, we, we have pockets of understanding. We have sometimes areas where it's OK, um, but when it gets to something a bit tricky, then we, we back away from it. Um, and, and then we get some areas where there's nothing going on at all. And um, I think it's been mentioned in the earlier discussions about visibility. Um, and it is a key factor. It really is a key factor that needs to be used both positively and negatively. So generally speaking, we tend to get the use, especially from a black woman's perspective, my own, that, um, you know, that we are seen and we need to be seen in a positive light. But when we are seen in our workplaces, um, we can, it can be one of two or three things. It can be that we're seen and that we're either a bit too much, a little bit too crazy, a little bit too loud um, and we need to tone it down. Um, or we get sometimes conversely the other, we're a breath of fresh air, we're bringing in lots of energy, isn't this great? Uh, and so something's not quite right. And then it's our fault. Or sometimes we have to unpick that and suddenly it comes down to us. And of course, what we're contending with, um, even though we've gone through that whole situation with the, the recruitment process, etc., jumping through with a lot of hoops, um, we will still get that kind of microaggression, still get and I've definitely felt it in my career, um, the aspects that actually were not quite enough. So what we're lacking at the moment, what I believe we're lacking is that comfortable, trusted strategic partnerships. We're, we're missing those. We're missing the strategic feedback. That's what we're missing at the moment um, for that diversity. And we're also missing that real opportunity to showcase um, the breadth and skills and um, experience that we have. And if we're not going to increase that, if, if this things don't change, then what we're sitting at and looking at really is more of the... Um, if you like, the discomfort that we're getting right now. And COVID is kind of bringing that all up. It's bubbling it all up. Um, and we're not going to get any change at all. We're just going to get the same old, same old. Or we're just going to get lots of people feeling very aggrieved. Change is difficult. Change is uncomfortable. But it doesn't need to be aggressive. It doesn't need to be confrontational. It just means that we need to have those conversations and they need to be, you know, mutual conversations. And we need a clear plan. We need something that means that actually we've got an outcome. We know where we want to go with this. Here are the milestones to say we're getting that. But rather than taking the stick, actually just making them really tangible. So as well as those regular opportunities to make sure that we're kind of we're, we're working towards that and, and a pledge, if you like, to ensure that that's the direction of travel. Um, we already have it already with regards to our networks. We've got those networks in place already. We've got them. They're there. Um, but we need to kind of encourage them and actually feed from them and actually utilise them. It's not good having just a network and then it's just a network. It needs to feed into the system. And we need to showcase talents and um, ethnic um, achievements from all employees, um, including, um, you know, black and ethnic minority employees. And we need to celebrate it in a way that's not, oh, my great. Oh, my goodness. Isn't this great that we've got five BME employees and they're doing really, really well. It just needs to be part of what we want, what we do. Um, so my biggest takeaway as I finish 
um, is really just to think about the fact that we need and want and welcome a genuine level playing field. That's all we want. That's all anyone wants. Merit is the only currency that we should be utilising to enable us to process, to progress. That's the only one. Just merit. If you can do it well, then you then you get what you get. If you don't do it well, you strive harder to become better. But it's really, really important to remember that if we're feeding this all through, if we're trying to smash those ceilings, if we're trying to ensure that actually things look different, we've got to make sure that people are seen. And for the majority of us who are black and ethnic minority or with any form of disability at all um, or any form of difference, it's going to be very difficult to be what you cannot see. Wow, Audrey. Wow, um, you're getting amazing comments. Um, we see you and we hear you, and and it is about us all working together. Um, and I, I've had a sense of the last couple of weeks that people are finding their voice, but are they being heard? Are they being seen? And actually there's a massive silence out there from the voices we need to hear from. Um, and we've got voices here, like Patrick I'm going to speak to the piece about being a white male ally and what he's doing in his schools, because we need everybody to be stepping up and speaking out and being part of the solution. So Patrick, over to you, please. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, as Anna says, I'm Patrick, I'm Executive Principal in the North West at the moment, uh, and speaking to you as a, a straight, white, non-disabled, old male head teacher, one of the 93%, as Alison said this morning. And uh, I suppose I'm going to give you my experience this morning of uh, my, my experience as, a, as an ally and the things I've been doing and encouraging to do now. And I use my allyship to actively promote um, and advance that culture of inclusion and equality and equity through intentional, positive, continuous efforts to support and benefit uh, women, uh, BAME, disabled, LGBT and education. And as it's been said by many people, if you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. Uh, so that's been my approach. And it's been actually a lifelong process in building that relationship and, and growing uh, based on trust, really, and, and, and working with marginalised or underrepresented individuals or groups. Uh, and also an opportunity to grow and learn myself and about myself while building confidence in others. Uh, one thing in my allyship is not, it's not self-defined. In fact, a recent podcast I did on, on being a BAME ally uh, with uh, We Are In Beta, um, before I even went into that um, conversation alongside Alana, I spoke to people within the uh, BAMED network uh, to, to say, what is it you want me to say? How can I be useful as a uh, an ally uh, to further this conversation? That's been important. It's not always been my experience. I, I was born in, uh, in the sort of small pit village of South Yorkshire in exclusively white communities, and my early life was, that's how it was spent, uh, broadened a little bit at university, but it wasn't really until I got my first full-time job in Bradford, uh, when I went in as a PE teacher, as a strong man, as a white saviour, as it felt, and when I look back, and I think some very patronising attributes to my character back then, uh, as I went through, and it, I don't really remember, although I felt uncomfortable with many of the things I was seeing and hearing from colleagues, I'm talking colleagues here, not just with the students, the first time I publicly remember calling out racism and sexism and homophobia was when I was just appointed as an assistant head at 27 years old, just short of 28, and that lost colleagues or friends in the staff room. Um, and that was fine and that felt comfortable. That was my first open active allyship. And that really grew as I became a deputy with whole schools and activities. And, but it really didn't become, um, I think, uh, in, in my view, a true, a true ally until uh, at 38. Uh, just before my 39th birthday, I got my first headship um, when I could sort of develop my own values-based vision for equality and, uh, and diversity with it within schools. And then I've since then taken it on to Twitter and beyond and grown exponentially in terms of my own understanding. Uh, so it's a journey I've been on and continue to be on as I go forward. Um, in terms of responsibility, people have been talking about the action you take, but um, really it's responsibility to everybody and particularly around those people who don't identify as allies at the moment, who maybe through some of their behaviours are starting to do so, who I'm wanting to really influence the most to encourage this growth of allyship uh, as we go forwards. Uh, as an ally, I 
I, I try to match the words I say here with my words. And I think actions, uh, words without actions, can actually be detrimental to the work and changing culture that we're wanting to see. Um, I make a continual investment in supporting others um, and trying to support others, people that reach out or where I see uh, an injustice that I want to help to address. And I hold myself accountable for that, encourage others to challenge me when I make mistakes. I also apologise and prepare to sort of rework my approach towards allyship when it needs to change. And that's occurred as well. And I think it's important to model that vulnerability as an ally as well. That's not easy. And actually being an ally at some point, it's not easy because some people, times people want to vent or their frustration comes out in the comments that, that you make. And I think I've had to become, I've had to learn and become increasingly comfortable feeling uncomfortable in that debate. And I think that's where I, uh, where I continue to grow. Um, I think, to be a true ally, you, you, it's not about, you hear people say it's not about me, but it really isn't and shouldn't be about me and my, my own protected characteristics uh, as a, as a, and the white privilege in particular, um, or as a man. It's about lifting others through my own advocating of their work, sharing growth opportunities maybe, um, recognising systematic, systematic, systemic inequalities and doing something about them or being part of doing something about them. Um, and actually believe in the underrepresented people's experiences. Uh, we mentioned this morning, Alana talked about how, how frustrated and furious she is when people call out you using the race card. And actually actively not doing that and listening and believing people's experience and people's stories. And, and I suppose most importantly, listening and supporting and reflecting on, on what we do. Um, I've become a, a sponsor for many, many people that reach out as well, actively championing and supporting and aiding their career and their career development through coaching, particularly at the time of application and recruitment for new posts. And I suppose the biggest thing I've done and, and where I felt the most uncomfortable and personally under attack is calling out inappropriate behaviour. I can give you several examples where uh, using my privilege to call out those people who are saying uh, or doing unacceptable things uh, where underrepresented people may not feel as comfortable. There was a recent example on BBC Question Time was filmed from my school and it was the episode where Lauren Fox was denying the existence of white privilege and in the green room I had a uh, we locked horns and that continued onto Twitter and I was I was I was vilified and actually threatened um, for the challenge I offered there. I've, I've withdrawn from an interview previously because of uh, racism that I heard from the chair of governors during that process and I've, I've called out in board meetings um, even the point when uh, someone was saying we need to grow a pair of balls as an organisation, I, I told them to woman up instead. There's a bigger story behind that, but some other point maybe. But uh, I try to use my influence to uh, to get involved and to help change things. Um, I think uh, Hannah's going to touch later on, I think, on CPD and recruitment, but actually it's not just good enough to do tokenistic approaches to uh, unconscious bias training. It's regular, it should be part of what we do and part of Actually, as we've said within the curriculum, uh, it's not Black History Month. It's not just Black Recruiter Teacher Month, <laughs> if ever such a thing existed. It should be how we do what we do all the time and, and our processes in, 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 our, in our schools. Uh, I think for any leader in school, one of the 97%, I think it's really short-sighted not to tap into that massive underrepresented talent pool. Um, th there are so many people and groups that are underrepresented that aren't there at the moment. We have a shortage of teachers, we have a shortage of leaders, so why shouldn't we be engaging? Uh, that's, that's maybe not the moralistic approach, but what we should be doing for education to increase the, the growth of leaders and, and, and teachers within schools. Uh, I reach out regularly to uh, hear the voices, to challenge and cross-examine my own view and keep learning uh, and keep supporting those around me. And I think my pleasures today, I mean, heard what I've heard and, and, and to continue what I'm saying here, I think my pleasures and ally day today is to, to continue feeling uncomfortable and having those conversations and to encourage other people to feel uncomfortable too and engage and uh, not, not to engage because it's too uncomfortable. Uh, I want to work to understand more of those systematic societal issues that actually played a role in my lucky career. Uh, as I see, it's not to do with luck, but even my, my privilege got me there and looking to change some of those. And actually continue to be an ally to champion and amplify the voices of, of, and successes of those underrepresented individuals and groups. Thank you, Patrick, for modelling how to be a reflective and self-aware straight white man um, and how to put yourself into a situation where 
we don't always know but you ask the questions and you sit and you listen and you learn um and we need more people to come and sit in this space and listen and learn so thank you so much for putting yourself out there as someone who's prepared to stand alongside people and do this work um and i think you've segued lovely here to hannah to think about some of the processes so hannah i, I know you can't do unconscious bias justice in five minutes um but please can you talk us through some practical ideas about um, how we can diversify recruitment. Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, as, as Daniel mentioned, I'm Hannah, I'm the co-founder director of LGBT Ed. I'm a very, very out proud gay woman. I think that's important to say. I'm the lead coach obviously for Leeds Beckett LGBTQ inclusion award in schools. Um, and I also run my own business and we specialize in uh, leadership and talent assessment selection, and diversity and inclusion. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I want to talk to you today about recruitment and, and bias. Um, so I want to ask you a question, which is, how do you go about choosing someone to be on your team? And when I say the word team, I mean your partner, your friends, your sports team, team of volunteers that you've selected for a specific project, or your team at work. Because in making those choices, what we think we're doing is picking the best person for the job. And some of the time we might be, but when we think about what best looks like, it looks like us, because that's what makes us feel safe. We're programmed to recognize more quickly the people who look like us, to value more the opinions of people who are like us and who have more shared experiences, and to listen more closely to the people who sound like us, to choose the people on our team who are the best by our standards. I was delivering a, a session, um, one of my sessions around unconscious bias in Lewisham last year, and at the break, I was looking out of the window um, and I could see a group of school children about to play a game of football. Um, the male teacher made two boys captain. Uh, this was a visibly diverse class, but both captains happened to be tall. They happened to be skinny. They happened to be white boys. Uh, they could have been picked purely on merit, but maybe not. Um, the to in and fro in of picking went on until the last person to be picked was the short, chubby black girl. And she went by default to the last picker. I've thought about that scene a lot since then and about how these ideals of what good looks like and what best is are drilled into us at such a young age and it can be so damaging. We need only to look at the makeup of leaders around the world uh, to see that the structures that have existed unchanged for years are those in which similar to me bias wins out in selection. And so I want you to think about how you go about choosing people to be on your team and whether at work you're creating the systems and processes which enable true inclusion to play out and whether you're reviewing, critiquing and changing processes uh, when you realize that what's happening is that you're attracting, sifting, choosing people who are all the same. We've seen the devastating ways in which conscious bias, prejudice, stereotyping plays out in the world. And we're reminded that despite our progress, there's so much further to go. Um, but let's look to unconscious bias now, which is deep. It's ingrained, it's in all of us, it's hard to notice in ourselves and even harder to stamp out completely. And when we're thinking about choosing people to be on our team, we know that unconscious bias sinks deeper and deeper down because we cannot be seen to be allowing anything but a fair, transparent, objective, consistent process to be rolled out by way of selecting people. Um, our unconscious biases, as we know, can be expressed through microaggressions, which are those small, subtle signals that we communicate through our behaviors. Um, researcher Albert Moravian found that only 7% of what we communicate to people consists of what we actually say. That the use of our voice, such as tone, intonation, volume, takes up 38%, and that more than half of what we communicate to others consists of our body language. So if that's the case, we can be sure that our biases are showing up even in the way we sit across the table from our candidate, or the way that we welcome them into the interview room before we've even asked the first question. So how do we get around this? Well, sometimes, and often you'll have heard this, we talk about fit. And don't get me wrong, fit is important. It's important that you assess whether someone shares your values and is driven by your mission to give the young people in your care the best education possible, regardless of who they are or where they come from. But fit can cover up a whole manner of biases. And fitting in means complying, means being like the rest of the team. Um, homophily is a theory, it's been around since the 1950s, roughly means birds of a feather flock together. Choosing people who are like you to spend time with, to associate with and to be in your team. We know this happens in all walks of life and it's part of the reason why we're here today because in education we are not diverse enough, particularly at leadership level. 
Um, in his book, Rebel Ideas, Matthew Syed talks about homophily, talks about homogenous groups, and he talks about collective blindness. He uses an example of the CIA, who up until very recently had incredibly archaic recruitment practices, and they're still now not as diverse as they need to be when you consider the vastness and complexity of the problems they need to solve. He talks about 9-11 and that there was no way that this complex and dangerous threat could have been seen for what it was with a team of white, English-speaking, Protestant, middle-aged, middle-class men. Some of the subtleties in the symbolism we saw the world over on our screens were missed, the seriousness of the message not considered. The selected analysts were individually perceptive but collectively blind. How can we expect to solve some of the most complex problems if we don't choose people to be on our team who have a diverse set of perspectives and experiences on the case? Diverse teams perform better. It is as simple as that. Now, back to my last girl standing in Lewisham. Uh, I'm an avid football fan and I nipped out on the break just to catch the second half. And you know what? That girl scored. Whilst everyone else was running as fast as they could to compete with each other, she had placed herself strategically on the edge of the D and she scored. She used her strengths in a way that were different, in a way that looked different to everybody else, uh, and she scored. She thought differently about to, how to play in that team. She did not comply, but she did win. So I want you to think about this today. How many times have you thought, this person challenges my assumptions, they're different, they're going to disrupt the norm here, and this person deserves the job? And how many times have you appointed someone just because they fit? What is it about them? And what, it, what was it about the person who didn't quite fit that was the wrong choice? Because maybe they would have scored. Finally, from me, here's the most boring call to action you'll probably get today. Um, are you checking your recruitment processes are objective and fair? Are you casting the net wide or going to the same places you've always gone to find new talent? Are you being transparent about your processes? Because to Alana's point this morning, they don't need to be a secret. Are you using frameworks that allow you to objectively score a candidate's performance using a common language on which you all agree as a school instead of being led by your gut? Are you aware of your biases and how they show up for you? Have you considered the wording in your job adverts and how they might exclude certain groups of people? Because sometimes that's what leadership and allyship is. It's not glamorous. It's about a quiet grind of making systems and processes fair. We've seen what happens when the quiet grind runs the other way. So as leaders and as allies, review that advert, tweak that policy, redesign that interview, because sometimes that is the biggest lever you can pull. Thank you, Hannah. We seem to have lost Hannah, but I'm sure she'll come back. Bye. I'm going to move myself in the stream. There we go. I'm back. Um, I, was, I was so blown away, Han, or, or, like four to arms. Far from being boring, um, very practical. Um, and it's about what we can all do um, collectively. I've got, I'm trying to keep track of the questions because Audrey and Han, you've been helping me with the questions all day and now I'm by myself. So I'm trying to read the comments and do the questions. So question one, um, Audrey, some of the audience are commenting that they feel like they're getting contradictory advice about whether or not we should ask people of colour how they are. Um, so can you speak to how it feels when people don't ask you and then perhaps give them a frame for how they should ask you, please? Great question. It's a really good question. And I and I do you know what I, sh I, sh I share the the anguish in it, in it. And I've gone through a bit of a cycle myself over these last couple of weeks. Um, OK, let's talk about if you you, you don't know what to say. Um, I suppose there sometimes there are right words, sometimes there are wrong words. I think, first of all, what I would like to have heard, what I would like to hear, is just an acknowledgement that actually this must be quite tricky at the moment. And it might, you know, just be vulnerable and just say, you know, I don't really know what to say, but I'm aware that there is something to say and I don't know what that is yet. Just saying that in itself just means there's an acknowledgement. And that acknowledgement is great. I think one of the things that possibly right now at the moment that probably a lot of black people are very sensitive to is the rightly meant, but that whole idea of all lives matter, kind of backing that up, that great a bit. It's not to say it doesn't. I'm not saying all lives don't matter. They do. But right now, right now, we're talking about black lives. 
And right now, we're unpicking that. Right now, black people are hurting. Right now, black people are, uh, are thinking, where do I go to express some of the pain and some of the hurt and some of the deep down pain that we've squashed down for years, not talked about, thought it's just part of the system. So actually, saying all lives matters to counteract with that will rankle and and then you'll start to get aggression because people are cross and they're angry so i would say acknowledge that you don't know what to say then it's a case of then going and, and, and doing a bit of homework but what the, the one thing you probably sh i would advise to steer away from is coming to a black person and say give me answers we haven't got answers and we even if we had the answers um we would have put them in place by now and things would be different we haven't got answers uh, we we want basically some solutions but it has to start with the systems and we live in a predominantly white country so i'm afraid we can't you know we can't do anything so that's really what we're looking for some acknowledgement yes don't make us recount it all over again what happened to you no, and I'm reading that on Twitter and feeling that pain. We don't want to revisit it. But actually, what we do want is for you to go away, do some work and then come back and let's then have a conversation about it. And some of the things that Hannah said already with regards to recruitment, I think for me, having been through those processes so many times, I think it's absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. Thank you, Audrey, and you're getting lots of thanks for just addressing that, because I, it's a bit like we talked about with the labels, which labels should and shouldn't we use? Should we be asking, are you OK? Should we not, not be asking? I just want to segue to you, Naomi, in your coaching um, sort of like space that you created, I think, can we just speak to how in schools can we create a space for voices to be raised, but also to be heard and for people to feel safe? And I'm not just talking about Black Lives here, I'm talking about anyone in a school. How can we create safe spaces? I think it has to come from beliefs, from principles, from values. You know, you, you have to have that shared framework and to, to create that foundation so that when people don't feel that they are being heard, they are able to call out and they have permission to call out and they're expected to call out that person who is not um, fulfilling those agreements. So it needs to be absolutely explicit that this is what we stand for in our school community. Um, and it shouldn't just be on the individual to call out the fact that they feel invisible. It needs to be on everyone to notice that. And if they don't notice it, for that person to stand up and say, this is how I feel, and for them to be heard and acknowledged and, and that to be acted on. And go back, keep going back. What are our beliefs, our principles, our values? That is our North Star. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Naomi. And I think just what I said earlier on about how we look at our students compared to how we look at our staff. We consider ourselves to be emotionally intelligent leaders. We like to think we all have empathy in us. We can see in a classroom or a playground which child is distressed. We just need to use that same lens on the adults around us as well. We, we, we can see it. We just need to choose to see it and choose to think about it. We would not leave a child in a playground crying. We would not leave a child in a classroom feeling unsupported. And that's how our staff are feeling in some of our schools right now. Hannah, can I ask you a question? What's coming up is the tension between individuals who want to show their authentic self at, in a workplace, but they feel like there's a tension between their authentic self and their professional self. Is that something you can just kind of explore, please? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a really difficult one. I, I, I think um, so. It, it kind of reminds me of uh, an interview when we launched LGBT. I was interviewed on uh, BBC Radio London by um, Vanessa Feltz, who 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 asked me. Um, I don't come in and tell my. I wouldn't go in and tell my young children that I was hungover. Um, so why do you need to tell them that you are a lesbian? Um, and I talked about kind of what is morally dubious and what is, uh, you know, part of the fabric of life. Um, so this question around authenticity, um, you know, I think that as a, as a school, as a culture, you have to define what that means and looks like and sounds like and feels like for you. Um, 
in terms of LGBT, it's it's not a one size fits all approach. It's not about wearing a rainbow cape every single day and you being the only one who leads the big gay assemblies. It's not about that. But it is about finding as a team what your what authenticity means and feels like for you and agreeing on that and then living it. Um, I, I hear that there's a tension, particularly with some of those hidden um, things, that there's a tension between kind of what, what you what you you know, your professional self and your authentic self. But what I would say is think about when you were growing up, what you needed. And that's the work that we do at LGBT Ed is needing and looking for the role models that we needed at, at school. Um, so it isn't about kind of sharing everything about your personal life, but it is about being authentic in who you are and agreeing as a school culture what that authenticity looks like, sounds like and feels like. Thank you, Hannah, great advice there. Patrick, can we just revisit? What's the advice to straight, white, able-bodied males about embracing vulnerability and embracing the uncomfortable? How, how do they start that journey to be an inclusive ally? Okay, just to start with, to pick Anna's point, there's not one governor, teacher or student at my school that doesn't know I'm married to Mel and I've got five sons. So I'm open about my relationships, why shouldn't anybody else? So just to pick up on that point there, I think it's, it's wrong that that's not the case. Um, I think the first thing to do, uh, diving into this, if you've not done it before and you've not done that, is, is, is very difficult. I think for, for anybody who's not been openly an ally before, it's difficult. I think engaging, first of all, in a conversation just around um, any of these topics that we've discussed today is a good starting point, and then to increase them to do so. But the, the, the one thing to do is just to be, I'm going to use women out here, be 10% braver just to jump in and have a go and actually start start becoming more comfortable feeling uncomfortable and it's fine and it's actually around listening not actually offering solutions and 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 i think as leaders quite often you put in the seat and you've got to have all the answers and i think it's okay not to have the answers and to be able to seek the answers from other people and to widen that group and to increasingly if we, if we don't if i have got to say for example if i'm a leader in a school that's exclusively white or exclusive leadership terms or exclusively male or, or, or not uh, for, for none of the groups that we've talked about today, then I think it's upon all of us to embrace that and actually challenge ourselves to make sure we are inclusive. So a starting point is engage and listen and ask people. So if you're asked how are you responding to Black Lives Matters within schools, don't just assume as a white male or white female or whatever, that you know the answers. Ask and seek and do those. And that's exactly what we've been doing in school. So, so don't be afraid to ask and listen and learn from other people. Thank you, Patrick. I'm just going to read out a comment from Angie Brown. As a black woman, she feels uncomfortable for her life. We feel uncomfortable listening to things we don't want to hear and having conversations about things we don't feel informed on. There is a continuum of uncomfortability and there's a difference there between people fearing for their lives and people fearing about judgment from something that comes out of their mouths. Angie, that's so powerful. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I, and I want to come back to you, Audrey. So some of the questions coming up are, are probably from people who didn't come to the event on Wednesday night. And they just want some advice on how to be seen and heard in a school where they feel like their voice is just going into an echo chamber. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, yes, it's it, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I, I, if I had the answer, then I suppose I'd be very rich and then and, and feel very content. Um, I suppose I'm, I'm now just going to draw back on on my own experiences. Really, I think uh, ultimately, if if you are not and you are doing everything that you can um, in such a way to to enable that visibility, to enable that strength. Um, that you possess to, to become part of the culture um, and if you're having those conversations one-to-one -one conversations collective conversations and, and it's not moving on you might have to question and I'm not saying that you just up and leave um, you know quickly but you know you can't flog a dead horse I think one of the things I've learned over my life and especially in these last five six years is that if you get to a certain point where actually your values and the way you are and your authenticity and yourself your true self you come you bring it you present it and it's not listened to 
then, you know, I literally live the title of this particular conference today, you know, be celebrated, not tolerated. If you're not going to be tolerated, then 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 move on because there will be somewhere where you can be. Um, I think that the quality of your conversations needs to be uh, in order to, um, and that's the thing that we've always had to contend with as a black um, as black um, people, um, especially black women, that you're either if you're too much, then you know you're shouting. You and, and any time you shout or you're trying to make your point made, you're aggressive. So if you're doing all of this in, in an irrational way and, and you're still not being heard, then maybe this isn't the, the, the community for you. Maybe this isn't the culture for you. But I think it's just about being consistent. I think um, I think Alison talked on Wednesday about keeping a paper trail, about, you know, putting things in writing and making sure that there is a very clear a narrative about what you are trying to do. I think that's that's all I can suggest um, from my own humble perspective. I, I, I couldn't tell you anything more than that. But what I have done, happily to say this on record, when it hasn't worked for me, I walk away. Thank you, Audrey. And I sent everyone the link and I'll share it again um, to watch the recording from Wednesday night. So There's some great advice there from women to women about how to raise your voice and use your voice and listen to voices in a school context. Our final question, I'm going to go back to Hannah. So it's a two prong question here, Han, about talent management. How can we talent support better in our organisations, in the staffing we have? And how can we diversify our talent pool applying for jobs? Over to you. Um, okay, how long have we got? Um, not long. I, I, you know, I think I think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a t complex question, and it depends on your context. What I would say is about searching for talent. Is often I have conversations, and and to be honest, often it's with governors who say, "Well, we need someone from a legal background," as if that's a reason why they don't have a diverse set of governors. And I'll say to them, "This this was at this particular point was around the point of." Um, having BAME representation and I said you you know we're in London do you do you really believe that there are no BAME professional legal professionals that exist who you could have on your governing body so one of the things that I would say and it's not it's not super practical but one of the things to say is look harder connect with grassroots organizations to help you for free share your job adverts you know that these are things that people can do um to support you find new talent if you've been looking in the you know it's that phrase of if you do what you've always done you'll get what you've always got look harder these people exist they're out there so don't tell me that you've tried hard you tried hard and that you're just not getting people through um in terms of talent spotting i think that's the, that's a question of looking at your data being mindful of your, the, you know what is the current makeup of your school tracking that pro, pro tracking progression in a really meaningful way and using that data of progression entry and 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 exit to, to inform what's happening and try and kind of get a, a, um you know both some quantitative and some qualitative data about why why people aren't moving up in your school you know and part of, part of all of these things is about you know to, to reflecting on your own practices reflecting on as Naomi said what is the culture you want to be um in terms of talent spotting yes it's okay it's it's a, it's a really good idea to to have a, a kind of a, a a talent spot a talent program that that lifts up certain groups of people but only if the system is working alongside that as well so there's no point having which is why you know lgbt ed we're working with individuals to make sure that they feel authentic when they go for those leadership positions but we also are working with the system so that the system doesn't then kick them out as they're going really enthusiastically into these um interview processes as of as their authentic selves so it's a two-pronged approach work with the individual but do what you can to change the systems whether that's the system within your school or, or more broadly to change the processes thank you hannah and i was just writing down as you were saying that it's all well and good leaning into diversity in our recruitment when we then recruit diverse staff we need to change our school culture to enable them to flourish and be empowered. I think I've heard lots of stories where schools have led with, we are welcome to diverse applicants, but they're not doing the work in the schools to actually make those, in, those diverse people feel inclusive in the school system. So I'm just gonna wrap up some of the messages that I've heard from this session. So thank you for all four, four inputs. Ultimately, do something, not nothing. Say something, not nothing. We need to challenge, we need to disrupt, and we need to dismantle. And I'm gonna repeat that. We need to challenge, disrupt and dismantle. It's a collective 
responsibility. It's a shared vision. This isn't on one person. And if we're doing it collectively in an organisation, it probably feels a little bit scary, less scary because it's not one voice challenging what's wrong. It's a, it's a group of voices. So thank you so much to my four brilliant speakers. It's a 10 minute break now until session four starts at 12 o'clock and we look more closely at the leadership we need to see. Thank you very much.